Okay, this is Chapter 7, Fossil Fuels Part 2. In the previous presentation, I gave a really broad introduction to fossil fuels, and we talked about how fossil fuels were created over the past approximately 200 million years through the decay of organic matter and laid down in the strata of the earth. And we also talked about the topic of reserves, something called proved reserves, which is an important topic. It'll keep coming up as we go along. In this presentation, what I'm going to talk about is oil and natural gas. And then in the third presentation, I'll talk about coal and some of the non-conventional fossil fuel resources, particularly oil from shale. That's a hydraulic fracturing of oil from shale. The tar sands, which are not completely, but mainly in Canada, and then something called heavy oil. So we saw in, I, I think, one of the earlier presentations how, where I showed the, the growth of energy use in North America, particularly the United States, how oil, the use of oil has really grown, petroleum has grown since approximately 1900. Well, the first oil well was in Pennsylvania and 1859. And of course, the huge growth of oil use coincided with the automobile and mass production of the automobile and the assembly line by Ford in about uh, 1913. And as we saw in, I think, one of the very early presentations, introductory presentations, that the world's appetite for oil continues to grow. Our use of oil is growing exponentially uh, still, even though we would like to get away from fossil fuels for various environmental reasons. Uh, currently, I mean, this is hard probably to even think about what this number means, but we produce 93 million barrels a day of oil worldwide. That's the most recent statistic. A barrel, one barrel of oil is 42 US gallons and 93 million barrels. I don't know if you should have a picture. I'll show you a picture of a, of a super tanker. Uh, later on in the course. Well, this 93 million barrels, we don't get it all from super tankers, but if we did, it would be about 40 plus super tankers a day of oil. So we use an enormous amount of oil. How do we use it? Well, about 90% of it we use for energy. We burn it. So we use it largely for transportation. So oil is mainly a transportation fuel because it has such high energy density. It's portable, and as we've seen, it's quite inexpensive. Uh, it is used a little bit for power generation, you know, diesel generators in remote locations, backup power for hospitals and things like that. But it really isn't used a whole lot. The reason is because oil is pretty expensive as a, uh, as a fuel relative to natural gas and, and indeed coal. Uh, so there's a tendency for electric power generation if you want to do it on bulk, uh, is to, to use natural gas is much cheaper. But there is some power generation. And oil, I don't know very many people, but I, until a decade or so, I did know people who had uh, an oil tank and had an oil furnace for their home. But again, it's pretty limited usage because it's relatively expensive compared to natural gas. But there could be, or it has been in the past, some home heating applications. So that's the burning of fuel of, of oil. Uh, there's also non-energy uses for oil, which represents about 10% of our oil production. Oil is used in the creation of a wide variety of products. So it's a chemical industry feedstock to produce plastics, which more generically or more properly is called polymers. It's used for making pharmaceuticals. It's made for using a wide range of petrochemicals, lubricants, solvents, that sort of thing. These are high value added uh, applications of oil. And so even when oil becomes quite scarce, uh, it, oil will always be around for, uh, for these kind of applications. It's the oil for energy use for just simply burning it um, where uh, there, there may be a short supply in the future. Okay, this is a lot of statistics, like a lot of pie charts, and I don't want you to get too concerned with it, but I'll try and talk about the major points that I would like you to take away. This is figure 7.5 from your textbook. This is the world oil reserves. So this pie chart here is the world oil reserves pie chart by company, 
by country, and this is the uh, pie chart of oil use by country. And it's only conventional oil, so I put a little note here saying it doesn't include things like tar sands or uh, oil from shale, from fracking, and things like that. And so let me point out a few things. So the United States has relatively small oil reserves. It might be a bit bigger than that now with fracking, but at least conventional oil. So it has a relatively small amount of oil, but it requires quite a bit of it in terms of its use, so for its economy. So the U.S., as we talked in earlier presentations, imp imports a lot of its oil. About a third of its oil comes from uh, abroad, and its economy is dependent upon imports of oil. The other thing you might notice from these graphs here is Saudi Arabia, big, pie chart, big part of the pie chart. And these are other Middle Eastern countries, the top four being Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and United Arab Emirates. And collectively, uh, that's almost 60% of the world's oil crude reserves. The other thing I would point out here is China. China, and this is a little bit of an old graphic from your book. China represents about 10% of the world's oil use. It's probably growing very rapidly. I'm sure it's quite a bit more than that uh, since the textbook has been published. Uh, but you'll notice it doesn't even appear on the chart above. So they don't have their own oil supply. So if China grows rapidly uh, using inexpensive crude oil, then it could have a very large impact on the supply of world crude and the demand for world crude. Okay, so another way to look at oil reserves, I'm looking at the in a table, table 7.2 from your textbook. Again, it's getting a bit old, but the general conclusions are the same. If you look at the, the countries in terms of proof reserves, it's Saudi Arabia, well, Canada, and let me explain that in a minute, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait. So you can see you've got these uh, Middle Eastern uh, countries. Canada is in here because it's kind of, I think that shouldn't really be there, but it's we're, we're high up on this list because they've included our our tar sands. So they've included the non-conventional oil. 98% of that seven, 178 billion barrels of oil is actually non-conventional. And how economic it is uh, to produce depends upon the world price of oil. So I, I really don't think Canada should be listed as number two here, but that's just my opinion. You'll notice the countries that have the asterisk on them. Those are OPEC. That's the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. You should read about OPEC in your textbook. There's a sidebar on it. Uh, they account for about 40% of the world oil production and about 65% of the proof reserves in the world. OPEC members are mainly from the Middle East and North Africa. Of course, Canada produces oil. So you might ask yourself, uh, uh, are we a member of OPEC? Well, you can see from the chart up here, we're not. OPEC is an international cartel uh, set up in the early 60s. Uh, the member countries uh, agree and coordinate on the price and the supply of oil in an attempt to control the uh, world price of oil. We talked about a geological trap uh, for oil in earlier on in this presentation or in the previous presentation. And I just want to talk about how oil is extracted. There's three phases to oil extraction or oil recovery. The first is primary recovery. In this case, in the primary recovery, when you drill the oil well, the oil initially flows under sort of a natural pressure. And you've seen these old movies. They don't do this nowadays because they have blowout preventers. But in the old movies, they used to drill and they'd hit a gusher and the oil would come spraying out uh, uh, under natural pressure. So that would be primary recovery. Of course, we don't let the oil do that these days. But the point is, is that during the primary recovery phase of an oil well, oil flows under its own pressure, under the pressure of the, the geological pressure. And then even after it stops, all you need is a little bit of pumping to remove oil. And we use something called a pump jack here. So this could be a, an electrically driven motor, for example, driving this pump jack. Just, it's just a, like a, well, like your typical hand pump going up and down. And you've probably seen these if you've uh, been in parts of the world where there's any oil production. 
Primary recovery recovers about 15% of the oil from the ground. Of course, it's going to vary from well to well, but in just round numbers, you get about 15% of the oil out of the oil well. So there's still 85% of the resource left in the ground at that point. So then you move on to secondary recovery. And in secondary recovery, what you do is you take water. And I know in Saudi Arabia, what they're doing is they're, a lot of their wells are in secondary recovery. They take ocean water and they pump it into the ground, into the geological formation surrounding the uh, wellhead. And this repressurizes the wellhead and forces oil towards the wellhead where it can be removed. And so in secondary recovery with this sort of pressurization, you can recover an extra typically 20%. So at that point, when secondary recovery is done, you still have 65% of the oil resource left in the ground. And then you can move on to some more extreme techniques called enhanced oil recovery. I suppose some people could call it tertiary oil recovery, but enhanced oil recovery. And there are a whole range of techniques here. So I've just listed a few. One is you can have steam. Steam's going to take energy, of course, but if you have a cheap supply of steam, uh, maybe from natural gas, you can inject it into the wellhead. So instead of water, you inject warm steam into the ground to pressurize the well, and that will reduce the viscosity of the oil. The oil will become flow more easily, and that will move it towards the wellhead. You can also inject carbon dioxide. So you can combine it with sequestration, carbon sequestration. But when when CO2, when carbon dioxide dissolves into oil, oddly, it greatly reduces the uh, viscosity of oil and makes it flow uh, towards the wellhead. So, And there are a number of other uh, techniques as well. These techniques, typically, you can get an extra 10% of the oil out of the ground. So when you're all done and the well is considered spent, at least with current technologies, there's about half of the oil is still left in the ground. So... As I mentioned, enhanced oil recovery is expensive. It can take energy. You might have to use natural gas to make steam. The amount recoverable uh, depends upon the price. As the price of oil goes up, you can spend more money to get uh, the oil out and it still be economic. But there are some limits. And I mentioned this earlier, that there's this input-output ratio limit, that if it takes more than a barrel of oil of energy to get a barrel of oil out of the ground, kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. So the, as the price goes up, yes, you can recover more oil, but only within limits. Once the energy input-output ratio uh, becomes too high, it kind of stops making sense regardless of the price. Of course, if you're extracting oil for non-energy usage, where you have a very high value added, uh, it may become uh, economical to re re remove the oil, but not for energy, not for combustion purposes. You may already know this, that petroleum undergoes a distillation process to get all the different products uh, that uh, we see in our stores. So crude oil is a mixture of hydrocarbons and impurities, especially sulfur. And we use what's called fractional distillation. This is a distillation column. This column might be 30 or 40 meters high. If you've ever been to Sarnia, Ontario, you'll have seen some. And so what's done is it's a bit similar to a, a distilling wine to make liquor, but with more components. So you take the crude oil, it's heated to high temperature, 400 degrees C, which vaporizes it. And then it goes up this tall column and this tall column gets cooler and cooler and cooler as we move up and there are trays in this column and the heavier hydrocarbons the things like lubricating oil the bigger molecules they they condense out early and lighter molecules like kerosene and then gasoline condense out at, at uh, lower temperatures and so in this way we can get all our different products gasoline which is quite volatile down to lubricating oil and some of the residues here such as tar that you might use for, for manufacturing a road. So they're very heavy, heavy molecules. So yes, petroleum is uh, distilled. It undergoes fractional distillation to produce all our products. This table shows a, a range of products of distillation from uh, petroleum. So the lightest stuff, you might get some gas off the top, uh, petroleum ether, then gasoline. And these these C numbers here are the number of carbon atoms in the molecules. And this is 
increasing boiling point. So the, the stuff at the top of the column condenses out at a much lower temperature. And so you get everything ranging from gasoline all the way down to lubricating oil, greases, and very heavy tar and pitch. Now, in practice, what you mostly want out of a, because we have such high demand for gasoline, is we want, we want uh, molecules in this range. And of course, uh, a refinery doesn't produce, you know, mostly gasoline. It produces a wide range of products. So the heavier products here undergo chemical and thermal cracking. So there's a, the refinery has a whole number of other processes to take some of these heavier molecules and convert them to gasoline because we have a high demand for gasoline. Okay, so next I'll talk about natural gas. Uh, Showing a picture here of a natural gas burner in a boiler here. Natural gas is mainly methane, about 80 to 95% methane, depending upon the well. So it's CH4, so one carbon molecule and four hydrogen molecules. Uh, and when it comes out of the ground, it comes out with small amounts of heavier gases and a bit of water vapor as well. So the heavier gases, mainly propane and butane, and the impurities, sulfur and some water vapor, they get removed at what's called the gas plant. So natural gas that comes out of a well goes to a gas plant for treatment before it comes to your home. And it gets the sulfur removed, so it doesn't, when you burn it, it doesn't smell, it doesn't create sulfur dioxide, which is an air pollutant. So these uh, propane and butane elements they are what are called natural gas plant liquids. So if you ever wonder where the, where the propane comes from your barbecue or the butane comes from your lighter, it probably came uh, as a byproduct of the natural gas industry. They're called natural gas plant liquids, NGLs. One of the big advantages of natural gas is it burns a lot cleaner than coal and oil. It produces less pollution. There's no, almost no particulate matter associated with burning natural gas. And this is called SO2. This is sulfur dioxide. We'll learn about this in the pollution part of the course. It's an acid gas. When you breathe it in, it creates a, a sulfuric acid in your lungs and it irritates your lungs. It's a, it's a severe air pollutant, but you don't get it with the natural gas because the sulfur is removed at the gas plant before it comes to your home. Natural gas is often referred to as a bridge fuel, meaning that while it's a fossil fuel, it's the best of the worst. It's the best fossil fuel. Uh, and it's going to provide a bridge to renewables. So you'll see things happening in the States and even in Canada where provinces are converting from coal fire generation, which is really dirty, as you will learn, to natural gas because it's got less air pollution and it produces lower carbon dioxide emissions. So it's better for climate change. So there's less CO2 per joule of heat about 40% lower carbon emissions for the same amount of power generation than bituminous coal, which is a typical mid-grade coal, and about 25% uh, lower than conventional oil, which isn't really used for power generation very much. So yeah, natural gas is a bridge fuel. It's something we're going to want to get away from because it is a fossil fuel, but it's the best of the, the, best of the fossil fuels. We use natural gas in quite a variety of different ways. In Canada, we produce about 10% of our electricity using uh, natural gas turbines. And here's a picture of a natural gas turbine. This is about, oh, I don't know, six meters long or so here. Uh, I'll, I'll describe how one of these works later in, the, in this course. So yeah, we, we use it to produce electric power through gas turbines. We also use natural gas for building heating. It's, uh, it's big in Ontario. About 80% of Ontario homes are heated by these natural gas furnaces. And, you know, maybe around 50% of Canadian homes. Natural gas is used a lot in industrial uses, especially heat sources for manufacturing. Things for making like steel, making glass, things like that. Things that require heat input. There are some residential uses. Uh, some of us have gas cooktops. You can have a natural gas hot water heater. You can even buy a natural gas uh, clothes dryer, though I would say the majority are probably electrical. There's also a small component of natural gas used for transportation, and you may not be may or may not be aware of this. Uh, it's called 
compressed natural gas. So this is not, this is just natural gas that's highly compressed to about 3,500 PSI. Uh, it has a pretty low energy density compared to liquid fuels. And so, for example, uh, your car, if you converted your car to run on compressed natural gas, you would get about half of the range, which is not desirable uh, for your car if you want to go on a road trip. But if you're a taxi around the city and you're a fleet vehicle where you can return to the same place for refueling often, and it's quite handy and, and it can be quite a clean fuel for cars. There's also non-energy uses for natural gas. It's a big chemical feedstock for things like uh, agricultural fertilizers, ammonia fertilizers are made from uh, natural gas. And this chart down here just summarizes the U.S. natural gas consumption in, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, the natural gas consumption in the United States. And it's got all the same uh, categories that I just talked about. Residential use, transportation, very small, that would be compressed natural gas mainly, industrial use, commercial heating, and uh, electricity generation, which is utility. So we use natural gas in quite a, quite a wide range of, of ways. Here are the world reserves. These are the proved reserves of uh, natural gas. This is conventional natural gas. I'll talk about non-conventional natural gas uh, later in this presentation. So world conventional natural gas proved reserves. You can see Russia's right at the top, Iran, uh, Qatar. The units here are TCF, tera cubic feet, or trillions of cubic feet, 10 to the 12 cubic feet. As I mentioned previously, there's lots of natural gas in the world. Natural gas is more plentiful than oil, and it's expected that world natural gas, you know, when its production peaks, it'll be about 10 years after the after so-called peak oil. It may even be more than that now with the large developments in non-conventional natural gas. One of the things I'm supposed to talk about in this course, because it's a liberal elective, is a little bit of the socio-political elements of energy. And I can't help but bring this up, this idea that Russia has the world's largest supply of natural gas. They supply about one third of the European Union's gas. It's a company called Gazprom, Russian company. And this has become, or this has been a political issue that Russia has been known to threaten to shut down pipelines as a political intimidation tool, and it's led to uh, the European Union seeking some diversity in its gas supply. But as an example, and you may remember this, that when Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula from the Ukraine in 2014, this became quite an issue. What can I say? It was hard for the European Union to take too hard a line on Vladimir Putin as you know, they feared for their uh, natural gas supply. So their economy is vulnerable to gas supply from, uh, from Russia. Natural gas is shipped a lot of times by pipeline. We have a lot of pipelines in North America. But when you have to ship uh, natural gas over a sea, over an ocean or a sea, you, you can't use a pipeline. And so it's done in the form of liquefied natural gas. So liquefied natural gas is, as it sounds, natural gas that's been compressed down until it became a liquid. So it's, it, it's minus 162 degrees C. You've probably all seen liquid nitrogen. It's very similar to that, but it's, instead of being nitrogen, it's, it's methane, CH4. So it's a flammable version of this uh, liquefied uh, gas. So it's cooled down to minus 162 degrees C, and it's shipped at atmospheric pressure in these spherical tanks. So these tanks are not pressurized. They're at atmospheric pressure, but we have these ins big insulated spherical tanks in this big ship. Now, why are they spherical? Think about that. Why are the tanks spherical? Well, a uh, sphere has the smallest surface area for a given volume. And you're concerned with heat transfer. This is with heat 
from the environment warming up this liquefied natural gas and causing it to evaporate. And so you want to minimize that evaporation due to heating, and so they're, they're put in spherical tanks. When you get this ship to its terminal, uh, all you got to do is just, just take the liquid natural gas and put it through a heat exchanger, add a little heat, and convert it back to, uh, to uh, gas. Not surprisingly, uh, island countries rely heavily, often rely heavily on liquefied natural gas. Japan imports uh, almost 100% of their natural gas as LNG because they have no natural gas supplies. Britain, about 25%. So that's liquefied natural gas. Oh, yeah, I didn't mention it. Of course, when you liquefy it, you uh, increase its energy density. Its, it, its volume decreases by about a factor of 600. So you have about the same energy in, in one six hundredth space. So that makes it viable to uh, put on a ship and ship to a country. There are non-conventional natural gas resources, and they're huge. Uh, one of them is called methane hydrates. You've probably never heard of this, but deep in the seabeds around the world, you know, deep down where it's near uh, freezing, near a zero degree C, there is methane trapped in the sediments. So it's methane that's trapped in a crystal structure of water. So it's called a methane hydrate. It's an immense resource. Uh, if you added up all the fossil fuels in the world, all the coal and oil and natural gas, there's at least twice as much carbon in, in, in the methane hydrates in the deep seabeds as all of the fossil fuels in the world. But the problem is it's really hard to get at. It's, it's you know, deep down, but it's there. There have been, what can I say, uh, attempts to recover it. There's been experiments to see how hard it is to produce, but it's currently not in production. It's just technically uh, too difficult, given the cheap price of natural gas at the moment. There's also cold bed methane. This is being used right now, even in Canada. Uh, yeah, it represents about, well, probably a bit more than 1% now. That stat's a bit old, but 1% of Canada's natural gas production in 2013. Uh, and what happens here is you drill into a coal seam. Now, you probably know that from miners, coal miners, the hazard, one of the hazards of going underground in a coal mine is that methane is found with coal and that can be an explosion hazard. Well, that's the same issue here. You've got methane gas in with the coal seam. What you can do is drill down into the coal seam. And I believe this is done with traditional drilling technologies. And you put a submersible pump down here and when you apply suction, the methane comes out of solution and you get a supply of methane. That's called coal bed methane. So, you know, why wouldn't you just go after the coal? Well, this coal may be, may be deep down, you know, maybe too much overburden uh, to go after the coal. But there's a huge resource, huge resource of coal bed methane in Canada, about 10 times the conventional resource. And we have big resources of natural gas in, in uh, Canada as well. So that's another non-conventional reserve of natural gas that could be exploited uh, over time if, if the price went up enough. Now, you may have heard of this. This is shale gas. This is a type of fracking. This is not fracking for oil. This is fracking for gas. There's been a shale gas boom in the United States. So, for example, in uh, New York and Pennsylvania, there's something called the Marsalis Shale Formation. And it's a a formation of shale rock. Shale rock is by nature not very permeable, but it has in it embedded natural gas. And what they do is they drill down, this could be a mile or two down, and then they use this horizontal drilling technology to drill into the seam. They inject water at super high pressures and fracture the rock. It's called hydraulic fracturing. Then after those fractures are created, when you remove the water, you get a you get a flow of natural gas. And there's just been an absolute boom of uh, natural gas production in the United States, particularly in New York and Pennsylvania. And you, if you were following the U.S. election, this became a political issue when you know Biden, whenever he was in Pennsylvania, would say, "Oh yeah, it was going to be easy on fracking," but some at some other points in his in the campaign, he said that you know he was going to ban fracking and things like that. So uh, it's a hot button political issue. 
fracking has exploded in the United States over the last few years. Fracking for gas here, so shale, what's called shale gas. Uh, it was 56% of the U.S. gas production in, in 2015. And a decade earlier, the U.S. was really concerned they were running out of gas. They were going to have to ship gas in using LNG tankers. But this new technology has turned it around. And this graph here, this is from the EIA, Energy Information Administration of the Department of Energy. It's a little old now because I think I got it in 2012. But it gives you the idea. So this is time... Uh, 2012 and uh, uh, natural gas production. And you can see this huge wedge of shale grass growing. This is just a prediction, but I bet you it's pretty close. And you can see the other sources of natural gas. We've talked about them. This is associated with the oil. That's associated gas, you know, the gas that comes off the top of an oil well. We just talked about coal bed methane. Uh, non associated gas is gas, non -as is when it, you find gas without the presence of oil. Uh, and there's offshore and onshore versions of that. You can see all of it was coming down. They were running into a gas shortage in the United States. Oh, tight gas is gas that's in a really tight rock, often things like sandstone, very hard to get it out. Uh, it's a bit like shale gas, but even, even harder to get the uh, gas out. And so you can see how uh, there's been just this boom in, in, in gas production. And it's one of the reasons why there's been a drop in coal electric city production in the United States because relative to coal, natural gas is cheap. There's an explosion of production of natural gas. And so it makes more sense to generate electricity from natural gas than it does from coal, which is a good thing because coal is, uh, you know, as we'll learn, a very, a very uh, dirty and high carbon fossil fuel. But in places like West Virginia, where the coal miners live, that may not be such a popular uh, thing to say. There's a little bit of uh, shale gas in, in Canada. It's much less developed, about 4% of our production in 2014. So I don't know what it is now. Maybe it's 5 6%, something like that. But it's growing. And I already talked about associated and non-associated gas, right? Associated is where gas is, asso is associated with an oil well. And non-associated gas is natural gas, is when you find gas that's not associated with oil. So just to keep these presentations at a reasonable length, I'll end there. In the next talk, I'll talk about coal and non-conventional uh, fossil fuels.